Back in the day, we took these during the Cold War, when our biggest threat were nukes, which can be easily tracked using still photographs. But IED and other terrorist threats were constantly changing and moving. It's impossible to track them using stills, so the Predator drone was born with constant video camera watching all day and night. People managing the drone felt responsible for the lives of US troops, even though the Predator was ineffective at stopping the IED threat. After realizing the Predator can't see through items in the ground to find an IED, who would have thought, they realized, let's just follow all people of interest 24-7 instead, so we catch them before hiding the IED. But when the Predator zooms in on one target, it misses everything else, and vice versa. This is called the soda straw problem, and I very much enjoy sugar, so this is a well-named problem. A researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in 1998 went to a movie with some bros, and they all wanted to watch Enemy of the State, this hip new movie that just came in theaters, but he wanted to watch Bugs Life instead, which for the record, aged very well. And after a good fight, well, he lost, and they ended up watching Enemy of the State. The movie has, of course, the NSA using a video surveillance satellite to track the main character, and the researcher was like, oh my gosh, I need to create the same thing in real life. And so Livermore bolted a camera to an AS-350 helicopter where it flew secret missions throughout California, including downtown San Diego. It was literally Google Earth, but live. And instead of a video like the Predator, it captured just two frames per second. Maybe if they watched Bugs Life instead, we would have shrink rays. After all this happens, a man comes into the picture called Steve Siddharth, and he decides, you know, this is pretty dope, and you know what, I can make something doper, and I'm kind of jealous of this guy. So he proposed a collaboration between the Air Force and Los Alamos National Lab to make their own aircraft, because he doesn't like the one that's already in place. Angel Fire was born, and it was a competitor to the one developed by Livermore. So, as a response, Livermore decides to beef up their own aircraft by changing its name to Sonoma, and giving the project to the Army Research Lab. The Air Force then took over Angel Fire, as they can't let the Army beat them, and in 2006 the cameras were both ready, both significantly more powerful than the original Predator. Side note, these cameras had a 1,000 pound pack stack of multi-core Intel PCs, which would have made that year's top 500 of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, maybe just enough power to run Crisis. After Sonoma was finalized, they realized the name was too tame, so Constant Hawk it is. Maybe now the Air Force will be too scared to compete with us. Constant Hawk was deployed in Baghdad for only 90 days, but it did so well that the aircraft stayed until the US withdrawal in 2011. It got deployed in Afghanistan in 2009 also, so go you, Constant Hawk. But the Air Force's Angel Fire then decided it wanted some action too. So it joined Iraq in 2007, then people asked, wait, these are like the same thing, so why not merge them together? They both like killing, the Hawk has more pixels, but Angel Fire transmitted live footage, but no, 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 no. Pride and glory gets in the way again, but Congress was done writing two paychecks, so they had the Pentagon build their own mounted to a drone, but the Air Force whined for not being involved, so the Pentagon went, all right, all right, stop crying, here's the project. Through Air Force's Big Safari organization, they improved this project, titling it Gorgon Stare. DARPA is all over experimental projects, so they jacked this project up with some steroids, developing the camera for it called Argus, forming WAAS. In this particular instance, Gorgon Stare was the name. Funny enough, the tech in the cameras came from mobile phones and the tech to process the image data from the video game industry, specifically the graphics chip from the PlayStation and Xbox. In 2009, this camera had almost 2 billion pixels, enough power to spot an object 6 inches wide from an altitude of 25,000 feet in a frame twice the width of Manhattan. It sounds harmless, really. In 2010, Gorgon Stare was rolled out for the official release like a new iPhone, and like a new iPhone from Tim Cook, it was kind of disappointing. It skipped frames, they couldn't achieve a 24-7 unblinking rotation in the sky, and it just didn't really cut it. But regardless, it was deployed in Afghanistan in 2011 with mixed results. 
So then they realized, okay, we need to mask our mistakes. So like an iPhone, let's just add some weird numbering scheme. So people realize this isn't the best we can do. Let's call this one Gorgon Stare 1. Now let's work on Gorgon Stare 2. And it's actually totally confidential, so no one knows what we're doing. Luckily, the inside scoop says it has much more improved tech. It's equipped with signal intelligence sensors that allow operators to intercept radio chatter and phone calls, presumably for the NSA. Gorgon Stare 2 was deployed in Afghanistan in 2014, and in the years since, the Pentagon likes them enough to want to invest millions of dollars into continued development of the program. Bravo. Then, the book talks about some other NSA and CIA programs at the end of Chapter 3. Nothing to worry about though, so I'm sure it'll be fine. And that's the end of Chapter 3, Part 1 of The Eyes in the Sky on Gorgon Stare. I just want to start off by saying I am thoroughly impressed by this book. I found it by chance at a bookstore. It looks a little cheesy, right? You look at this cover, you're like, all right, it's whatever, eyes in the sky, uh, big red eye. It looks a little cheesy. And I didn't really have high expectations for it, but whoa, it's in depth, super in depth. This book is packed with information and I can wholeheartedly say, I think everyone in my community should read it because it really does draw you in like nothing else. I was like trying to stay up just reading this last night. Like, I need to keep reading, I need to keep reading. Now, for the actual breakdown. A spooky line for me is on the top of page nine. Let me... See, I'm not advanced enough to get those sticky notes like those English majors, but... Crews would get to know their targets well. Ward said that it was not uncommon for the operators to develop an odd kind of affection for the pixelated characters on the screen. Some of the younger operators would give the targets nicknames. The target who smoked a pack of cigarettes a day might be called Cancer Man. The one who had to stop and pee every 30 minutes, Tiny Tanker. <laughs> Ward didn't like this. Don't give them nicknames. He remembers telling some of the younger pilots, because you may watch them die. It, it's just interesting, because it's true. With, with lots of these surveillance tools, you can definitely assume that there is going to be kind of a loss of the, um, the human interaction. You don't really interact with these humans, and there's a big... Um, dehumanization aspect of it. It does look like characters on the screen. So I just think it is interesting seeing that, like specifically mentioned in this book, that they are given nicknames as if they're just characters in a video game. I'm just looking at some of my notes here. A fun fact in this book that kind of blew my mind a little bit, I hope this blows your mind a little bit too, but the Predator, the original Predator, found Osama Bin Laden out in the open and the Navy decided not to strike. This was the last open shot at Bin Laden before 9-11 which I thought it was just crazy to hear. Um, this to me is not only crazy just because it's a cool fact, but in my opinion, it's a perfect example on how modern surveillance doesn't work. Um, sure, they saw Osama, they said, oh, should we do it, should we not do it? But there's no way in that they can predict that there's gonna be a huge terrorist attack. And if they had known it would have killed thousands of people, I'm sure they would have acted. It's estimated that up to 600 US service members and countless Iraqi civilian lives were spared thanks to Constant Hawk, which is the army version of the aircraft. But it went on its own killing spree of killing 3,000 suspected insurgents and captured hundreds more in its first year alone. So the question is, is this technology just? Um, where is the boundary of killing versus saving? And it's a really tricky subject. I don't have an answer. I really don't want to get into the discussion on my own in a video, but it's just something to think about. Um, so far in the book, the author says any major stats towards the success of this aircraft are kept confidential, so we can't really verify hands down whether or not we're saving or killing more people than it's even accurate. Um, it's really hard to verify this kind of stuff. And actually at the very end of section three, it was chapter three, it was crazy seeing how this technology starts to leak into areas you really don't want it leaking. Um, the end seems to hint at this being implemented for more domestic issues. Um, the next part of this book will supposedly cover these incidents, um, so I'm pretty pumped and scared to read about them, but it's gonna be fun to cover them, just to see like, okay, this originally used to be for war, how is it going to transition into our daily lives? To join the reading, join the Telegram community reading group in a description, or send me your comments and updates through my website directly. I'd like to put in the community's thoughts into these videos directly, but I didn't really get anything so far from the community. It's been pretty slow. So the more people we join, the more activity we can push through it, the better I think these videos will be. Um, you can also order the book using the Techlore affiliation link to kick back to the channel. Don't forget to join the channel's communities, and that's really it. I hope you learned some cool things today. It's spooky stuff, but I hope it's still 
valuable information to know. And I'm excited to see you all for the next Gorgon Stare video. Have a lemurish day. Peace out.